y'all, this is Lou Temple, and you're listening to Don't Go Out There podcast right where you want to be. You follow me? They've conquered the big screen. Now, get ready for the spin-off sure to send chills down your spine. It's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin in Don't Go Out There, the series. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There podcast. Just want to thank all of our fans and listeners. Really appreciate the support. You guys are awesome. Before we get into tonight's review, just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. Everything about our podcast is on the website. All of our episodes and interviews, if you want to check those out, we've done some incredible interviews in the past. Go check them out there in a specific tab by themselves so you don't have to scroll through hundreds of episodes on Apple or Spotify, etc. We also have our store if you want to grab a shirt, a mouse pad, a hat, all that good stuff. We'd love to see your pictures, you know, rep your favorite podcast. And Chan's Etsy page is also attached if you want to grab a Tumblr. All of our social media links are on there as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Like us, subscribe us, follow us, all that good stuff. And the last thing I want to shout out on our website is our Patreon. We call it Blood Donors. Uh, we you know we have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind. If you want to support us, help us pay the bills, as we say. Or if you want, if there's a movie you want us to review, that option is available as well. Uh, just check out our website, don'tgooutthere.com. Also, if you haven't noticed, we've recently joined the Believe Network. So there's some ads on our program now. But if you want ad-free content, go check us out on Blood Donors. The ad-free episodes will be available there. We appreciate your support. We hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back, everybody, to DGOT, the series. I'm really excited to start a new a new program this week. This week is Brother Dustin's pick. Dustin, would you like to announce the series you chose for us to review? You damn right I would. So when we uh, first kicked around the, the ideas of doing a spinoff and covering series, there was like two shows that popped into my mind. Like, I want to do these two shows first. Ultimately, I ended up going with The Walking Dead season one. Now, The Walking Dead is a show that I watched it when it when it was brand new and I liked it. And then it became something that my ex-wife and I, we got really into it and I liked it. And what's funny about the show and what's funny about my marriage is they fell apart about the same time. I think it was like season four or five. Uh, they both went downhill. But I will say to this day, though, I stand by the, the first four seasons of this show are really good. I never I didn't finish watching the show. I just kind of stopped. And last year I did a rewatch, started at episode one and I finished the show all 11 seasons. And when I did that, it cemented the fact that, yep, we need to discuss this show. I want to talk about it with you guys. So The Walking Dead. All right, I'll go next. I hadn't seen this this show, none of it, not one single episode. And it was one of those shows that it's not like I didn't want to watch it, but I'm one of those people who see a series and there's this many seasons with this many episodes and there's so much to catch up on. I'm just getting overwhelmed, so I just walk away from it. I was like, I'm just not even going to start it. And uh, But this show changed that for me. And Dustin, episodes one and two, I thought were both very good. So I, I liked both episodes. They were emotional. It was a new concept. I got a little bit of qualms with a couple, you know, just a couple things. But I, I liked both episodes. I was very entertained. Hell yeah. Man, Nico, I'm right there with you, and I'm actually super excited about this one, too, because The Walking Dead is just one of those things that I did want to get into, never had time to, and then, just like you said, it went on so long, and this universe got so overwhelming to me. Yeah. I mean, I I knew the names and stuff from pop culture, which honestly did affect some of my viewing experience. I'll get into that. But, you know, like, like Dustin was on the last series, I'm going to try – to take these two episodes at a time and not look forward. But these first two episodes were just so damn good and, and enthralling to me. Like I texted in the group chat the other day. It's going to be really hard for me to not binge the rest of it. Dude. And I'll say real quick, Mike, before you go, you mentioned the universe got so big, dude, there's so many spinoffs. You've got fear of the oh, walking it's dead. It's you've ridiculous. got the Daryl Dixon spinoff. You've got tales of the walking dead, the walking dead world beyond the walking dead, dead city. I don't know. I've never even heard of those last three, but they, that's dude, what Google says. Dude, they had they had a talk show after each episode. Yep. With a, and that's a show that CM Punk was on a, like a few times yep. as a normal co-host. And then they had a show about that show. Oh, oh, 
where they would talk about the show after Walking Dead. Like, I'm not making that up. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. Like, there was like so there a was, fear of the Walking Dead spinoff, correct? So the the fear of the Walking Dead was a spinoff, absolutely. And you're talking about the Talking Dead or Talking Dead yeah, that yeah, Chris Hardwick yeah, hosted. Dead. Yes, and that that was entertaining because they would have you know it actors was. from the show on, and they would have other famous people that had input on the show, like CM Punk. So yeah, that was an interesting show. Okay, so other than Dustin, I I was the only one familiar with this fran- or this series. As you, I'm used to I'm I'm used to movie lingo, so franchise came to mind. But I was the only other one that was had seen parts of this series. Look, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I have not seen all these seasons. I tapped out after season three. If you ask our listeners, apparently that's the right time to tap out. Um, but I kind of want to do what Dustin did at some point and fit. <laughs> Funny because it's WrestleMania weekend. I want to finish the story of Walking Dead, but I was excited to start back at the beginning again because it had been so long. Um, I love these first three seasons. I like episode one a ton. I like episode two as well because it it does a good job laying some background for what I think is coming. Um, yeah, man, I'm excited to talk about it. It's been a long time. I really like episode one a lot. Like, I can't think of a off the top of my head. There are better pilots, but I can't think of a episode one that got me hooked on a show quicker than this. Like, I mean, just like brand new series, hadn't heard anything about it. Everyone, I was seeing all the previews, and I remember the first time I watched it, I said, I'm in. This is fucking awesome. Uh, Even Breaking Bad did not get me on the first episode. Uh, And The Wire, The Sopranos, etc. Like, this is a really good out-the-gate episode. And I liked episode two as well. So I'm excited to start with it. You know, it's kind of funny you told that story, Dustin, about you punting after a certain season and then going back and doing a rewatch. That is, and I'll pick. I'll pick season one. I, I said it in my list. I think it's like my second one, maybe that I want to pick. But I did that with True Blood. Like I got to a certain season. I can't remember which one it was, and was like, "This is fucking. This has jumped the shark too much. I'm done." Like I was finished with it. But then did the same thing you did. Went back, finished it, and wish I hadn't finished it. Like so, just throwing that out there, Mike, as some advice. Like well, maybe, so, yeah, I understand. So I can speak to that a little bit for this show. Um, there's certainly seasons. I mean, there's 11 seasons. There are seasons that I felt like, uh, uh, there's certain seasons like I didn't need that, but the last season gets, you know, I enjoyed parts of the last season. So I, I recommend watching it all. If you get hooked into it, um, if you get through and season four to me is one of my favorite seasons. Uh, I don't want to spoil it too much, but they find, they find what they think is a, a place that they can live forever. And then like it does in the show, shit goes awry. And uh, it's got some some of my favorite moments, including the appearance of friend of the show, Lou Temple, is in season four. Oh, and okay. I, I, I think maybe in three. But um, Unlike Lou, I'm going to take a sip of water here. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, this is a show. I, I'm glad that I went back and watched it all just to say that I've done it. Because, Brian, you know I'm a completionist. Like It drives me crazy not to finish something. And... <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to watching it again. So, like, if we do this long enough and we pick these seasons at random to go back and, you know, go back into The Walking Dead, I'm down. Yeah, You know, I, I say the same thing about the the movie podcast. We have forever content. They're not going to stop making them. There's a million things we haven't covered. Like, I, I think we're going to be pretty set for a while on the series. So, I think... You know, even if we ran out of other things, we could just do the Walking Dead back to back to back to back if we really had to. <laughs> so I think we're going to, because there's 11 fucking seasons of that shit. I think we're going to be good. My only request yeah. with that is, if we do the series like that, please let's go in sequential order. <laughs> we can't no, hop- man, yeah. do season yeah. six. Oh, yeah. Let's do we can, no, we can't hop around like we did in, in the damn franchise. How how have we done Halloween one twenty eight? Like I can't do that for Walking Dead. I'd be so. Well, we lost. did it with we did it with Saw too. We jumped around for Saw a little bit. Every franchise we jumped God around. Damn it! All right, guys, bear with me. Lord, bear me strength when I'm reading this. I've got a lot of reading tonight. Um, Walking Dead episode one, days gone by. Not to be confused with Keith Urban's Days Go By. It opens with a look at an empty road and one sheriff's car approaching. 
We see some overturned, wrecked, and burnt vehicles as the cop car stops. Deputy Rick Grimes gets out of the car and grabs a gas can from the trunk. He looks concerned and confused as he assesses the situation. He walks down the hill where he sees personal belongings scattered about and then sees a dead woman in the front seat of a car with flies buzzing around her. He gets to the gas station finally where he's greeted with an unfortunate message, no gas. As he turns to head back to his car, he hears a rustling behind him. He looks under a car to see a girl in bunny slippers walking and picking up a stuffed animal. Over three and a half minutes into the episode and we get our first dialogue as he calls out, little girl, I'm a policeman. She turns around and we see that she's not okay. She's got the zombie mouth. She starts growling and walking towards Rick, and he's forced to split her wig with his revolver. Then we get an opening, our opening credits, which are accompanied by a perfect theme song and images of a, a deserted and dil- dilapidated world. On the other side of the show intro, we see two cops, Shane and Rick, eating burgers and fries in their car, talking about the difference in men and women. And then Shane asks Rick how things are with him and Lori. And we get a notion that things aren't so great in the Grimes household. The two get a call from dispatch about a high-speed pursuit, and off they go. They lay a spike strip across the road and prepare for the incoming criminals in a, with a couple of other cops. A beautiful 1971 Pontiac GTO is driving like a bat out of hell and is completely destroyed when it hits the spike strip. What a waste. The officers approach the vehicle, guns drawn, and when the driver gets out with a gun, the officers light him up, but not before he shoots Rick in the torso. He's okay, but his vest sto- his vest stops the bullet. They think they've got both occupants out of the car, but the passenger shoots Rick again, this time getting him in the ribs. The passenger is taken off, and Shane calls for help for Rick. Fade to white, and Rick is in the hospital. Shane brings him flowers, which is a nice gesture, but I'll tell y'all right now, if I'm ever shot, don't bring me no damn flowers. I'm not about that. Rick tells Shane the vase is special and asks if he stole it from his grandma's house, and he's got a full beard now, and the flowers are dead. Shane's gone, and we see that Rick was out of it for a while. That's the open. What do you guys think? Okay, so it probably doesn't bode well that I'm asking a question right off the bat here, but this cold open, this is a time jump, right? I mean, like, is is this while he was on the road later in the episode looking for gas before, you know, he hits that suicide couple's house? Because otherwise, I was lost. Yeah, so that's the, okay. that's a, right. everything after that, after the, or before the opening credits was a flashback. Okay. Or a flash Just forward. making sure. So we Quentin Tarantino did there. Okay, got yeah. it. All right. Well, it was definitely a very effective cold open. I'll give you that. You know, playing on the heartstrings with a little girl right off the rip was a little fucked up there, Walking Dead. But on a technical note, the zombies look amazing. Like, this episode won an Emmy by itself for outstanding prosthetic makeup, and it was well-deserved. I mean, but with KNBFX and the Greg Nicotero who served as a makeup supervisor involved. I mean, how could it not be amazing? I mean, and it really was. Uh, So with the shootout scene, one of the downfalls of knowing pop culture and knowing that Rick is such a big part of the series, I was never really worried when he got shot here. I'm also coming into this with preconceived opinions on John Barenthal. I'm one of the few people that did not like Netflix's Punisher series, and I didn't like him as Frank Castle. So I don't know how he plays out the rest of the series, but I immediately did not like Shane here. Um, something I did notice, though, I'm pretty sure is a goof, but Rick gets shot just below his left shoulder in the back. But when he wakes up in the hospital, and thereafter, really, I mean, he's shown with a bandage over his lower left abdomen, and there's no scratch on his back at all. So just throwing that out there, too. But very good set of first scenes of a series. That, you know, it really gripped me, and... You know, at least through these first two episodes, never really lets me go. You know, I feel like that that could be a lyrics to a song. So you're welcome for my <laughs> lyrical genius there. This open puts me right back in time to the first time I watched it. Hadn't watched it in a long time. Puts me right back in that mind or right back in the place I was in life when I first saw it. I thought that was really cool. We hadn't done a movie in a, or a show in a long time that got kind of like gave me that feeling again. So I thought it was neat. Um Effects on the person in the car, you mentioned the effects. I think the effects hold up really well. I think, as you've heard me say a million times over and over again, the sound or lack thereof is really effective in this opening. Typically for like a movie or any other TV show, there'd be a score here uh, as he's kind of walking around and looking, uh, and there wasn't. And it made it creepy and very, very effective. Uh, (laughs) I thought this little girl was about to eat his ass. Pause. Okay, pause. Uh, killing a kid, which we've talked about a million times, 
takes a lot of balls. I know it's a kid zombie, but hey, I think killing a kid in the opening scene is always man, it was crazy. Um and then we you know, we get to the title card and stuff, and I, I just gotta say, I've never seen anyone else use the ketchup from their burger as a fry dipping sauce. Creative. Don't know if I approve of the method, but at the very least, making you know, you know, he's crafty with it. I'm okay with it. Have you uh, at least seen someone put ketchup on a burger with their fry? No. Oh, man. Never seen wow. that. Now, I've seen people put fries on the burger. I've done that. That's awesome. Oh. But Well, I mean, if you don't uh, have a utensil to spread the ketchup and stuff on there, then that's – fries perfect. It works out great. Y'all spread, y'all spread ketchup? I usually just – this is going to sound questionable, <laughs> but I usually just squirt it and, and leave it. I'm the I don't same spread way. it. Uh, okay. I'm a full-time squirter. Oh, oh, my bad. God damn it, Mike. What? Sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie. The line, "Damn bitch, you've been hearing this your entire life, and you're too damn stupid to learn how to turn off a switch." I thought was fucking hilarious. Um, and then the, the the comeback later, she's good at turning off lights. I thought was funny. Here's a question. I don't know if we have any cop listeners. Do cops still have partners like this? Like, I feel like they don't ride around like this together anymore. Uh, every cop I've been pulled over by or seen is basically by themselves. Uh, so I said, maybe that's a big city thing, but I know this this is portraying a small town, but yeah, I don't really see that either. Sure. And I've also never seen this spike pad in the middle of the road to stop like, you know, people from getting away. I've never seen that. I thought that was cool as fuck. And badass if it's a real thing, not going to lie. You never watch cops, man. You never watch cops. They use that all the time. Yeah. I wasn't big on, man. I was, yeah. It's fine. Like, I know of cops. I've watched cops, but not, like, intentively anyway. And so, man, if they'd have killed Rick right here, talk about a show with stakes. That would have been the fucking – that would have been crazy. Uh, obviously, like you said, though, Brian, because of my knowledge, one, I've seen the first three seasons and how the show goes later, I'm very aware not to be scared of Rick dying here. But I thought it was really well done. Uh, and, and love – I love the idea to signify a time jump when he wakes back up, the flowers being dead. Like, that was my first, like, oh, those flowers, I mean, it take a little bit to die, you know. All right, starting off, I just appreciate Dustin doing the scene by scene. You know, I kind of made it, made him aware that I was just a little overwhelmed just because I was so lost and clueless. But I do feel bad reflecting after him saying how much he loved these two episodes. And I can't blame him. This first episode is fantastic. And I appreciate you mentioning this, Brian, and y'all letting me know that this was a a flash forward because I was kind of confused. Like, why did he get out of his cop car amongst all this chaos to get gas? I know an officer who gets free gas didn't let it run out of fuel. And I was like, man, <laughs> diesel two ninety nine. I missed them fuel prices. <laughs> right. Nitpick, but there's no way he doesn't see that no gas sign from a good bit further away. And I was like, I was really caught off guard. This show's first on screen kill as a kid. Big props to Franklin Darabont, the director, the creator. Man, in the makeup, I thought it looked incredible as well. We get good buddy cop talk until we find out Grimes has trouble at home with his wife. I wonder if that'll come back to play later in this episode. <clears throat> Saying, I wonder if you care about us at all to your husband in front of your kid. I think that's nasty work. That's awful. Women can be so mean. <laughs> Are these pursuing cops idiots or do the sheriff's deputies not relay they put spikes in the road? Not sure who to fault here, but the car flip looked incredible. These sheriff's deputies are terrible shots. Who trained them? Harry from Dumb and Dumber? Grimes, you got to get it together, brother. You get hit once in the vest. Keep your eyes on the crime scene, my friend. But that gunshot that he got under his shoulder, that looked super painful. You saw all of his rib meat flying everywhere. It looked super painful. Every time I see a person talking to someone in a hospital bed, I can't help but see the Talladega Knights bloopers. Shout out to Mike Honcho. Uh, I thought it was a fun, action-packed opening, Dustin. That's all I got. All right. Rick looks at the clock, and it's stopped. He tries to climb out of bed, but falls to the floor. He calls for help, but no one comes. He looks in the mirror and chugs some sink water before heading into the hospital hallway. There's a bed in front of his door, and the place is wrecked. He picks up a phone, but it's dead, and then he sees a half-eaten female corpse in the hallway through a window. The walls are riddled with blood and bullet holes as he heads to the opposite direction, and we see a chained-up door that has don't open dead inside painted on it the door rattles and hands poke through and hear some we hear some grunting and growling in a panic rick tries to find an exit he uses matches to light his way down a stairway and finds an escape outside the ground is covered with decaying dead bodies wrapped in sheets there's a ton of them 
He finds a makeshift military base full of abandoned uh, Hummers and helicopters and more dead bodies. After finding a bicycle, we see a half corpse laying next to it. And remarkably, it rolls over and reaches for Rick. It scares him shitless and he rides off down the street. He gets to his house where Lori and his son Carl are long gone. Rick cries on the floor for a while and the gravity of the situation sinks in. He, he thinks that he's dreaming and heads out to his front yard to take a seat. Outside, he sees a man walking down the street. As he watches the man, he's nailed in the face with a shovel for, by a kid from behind. He says, Carl, and the boy's father shoots a zombie before telling his son, you know they don't talk. He asks Rick what his bandage is for, and Rick passes out before he can answer. Go ahead. Yeah, the other pop culture thing I know from is is that meme of, Rick, look, I guess it's Rick on going over looking at Carl, like, oh, what are you doing? You know, it's always like four. That's, that's the only yeah. thing that I know this from, but I don't have any idea what season that's from or anything like that. But also, no, Carl doesn't die. So there you go. Um, now, where I was a little bit lost, the first set of scenes, when Rick wakes up to this desolate world, I thought to myself, okay, here we fucking go. Like the hospital scenes are great, although nothing really happens. And Frank Daramount, Nico, you, or Daramont, Nico, you brought him up. I think he did a fantastic job writing and directing this episode. Now, I'm new to the series, and I know I'm being a little bit more interactive than normal here, but I'm curious. I read that Frank got fired in season two over conflicts with AMC. Like, what happened? Do you guys know that? Nope. Oh, I also have a follow-up <laughs> question here. So, uh, Does the series dip a little without him being involved? When did he get fired? Uh, season two. I think three and four are good. Like I said, the first four – are really okay. good to me. All right. Anyway, three is sorry. Good. Three is good. I mean, that's not the reason I stopped watching. I just became a fuck, a lazy fuck. <laughs> I, don't, I got you. Unattentive fuck. <laughs> anyway, like I said, love the hospital scenes and how they look, you know, kind of be shot with a handheld camera. Uh, I feel disoriented with Rick, which is also a testament to Andrew Lincoln as well. I think he acts his ass off right off here. Um, it's kind of like I am legend in a way where, you better be a fucking good actor because it's just you for most of the episode. And he killed it. Like, it kind of surprises me. He didn't really do a ton else besides this. I mean, I know he was in love actually, but I mean, barely, maybe he just made a Brinks truck of money from this and chill oh, out. I mean, I would have, he definitely did. Uh, I'll say something that was shocking to you. You said something was shocking to you. Something that's shocking to me is we talked about the talking dead earlier. It's shocking uh -huh. how many of these people are actually British. Andrew Lincoln does oh, not really? sound – he's British. Like, he's British. Wow. And, no, and I did so, not know that. And so, and so is Morgan, the guy who uh, was there at the end of this set of scenes that said, you oh, know, they don't shit. talk. He's British. It blew my what? fucking mind. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's crazy. No, I didn't know that either. I did keep telling myself the entire walk outside of the hospital, like, find a fucking gun. Uh, I can't help thinking that that would be, like, my first move after seeing all these dead corpses outside. And last thing I want to touch on. The creme de la creme of this episode, I think, is that amazing looking half corpse. Like this looks fucking amazing. They call it a bicycle girl. And apparently it took four hours to put on the makeup and they did it old school with covering the lower half of her body with blue pants to be edited out. And what is this? 2010 on a TV AMC budget? Like the CG on the bottom half of this torso is fucking pristine. Like it's perfect still. Uh, I mean, we've seen big movie budgets after 2010 use CG, and it looked like absolute shit. So, yeah, man, I would not get the fuck up out of bed here. Like, th th this man is not 50 Cent. You know, reason to get shot that many times and try to rush back too quick. Take the time. Let's rest. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I agree with you. Love these hallway tracking shots in the hospital, and the way they like use the kind of amp up the score a little bit. They start flickering the lights. I think it's a like an ins a good sign of impending danger. Shit's about to get a little crazy, and it does because bam, there's a uh, you know an eaten body on the floor. I got to be honest, Rick would be my first victim if I were a zombie. This motherfucker's wounded already; he can barely get around. I'm going after this motherfucker and eating his flesh. Just throwing that out there. It's Joe for him. Um, we talk about this in every zombie movie we do, and I kind of mention it a lot when we talk about the Purge franchise, but how how do you make your chaos look? How, how realistic is that chaos? How fun is it? How scary is it? And I think they do a great job of just make, you know, anything post-apocalyptic in a way. 
How does that look? And I think they do a great job of capturing how it would look. Like I think it's a, they do a really damn good job here. Half eaten or, or the half eaten woman, the half corpse. I thought it was awesome. Um, and if I were in Rick's shoes, I'd mic settle myself very quickly if I saw that crawling across the ground. Um, and I wouldn't. And like Rick too, I wouldn't think this was real. I mean, I've been shot. <laughs> I'm, you know, who knows? I could have died, and and this is what you know I'm dreaming up on my deathbed or whatever. Like I would very much think this kid ain't real, man. What the fuck? And and, and I like that. But, but, like even though I've seen it, like there's a part of me back then that wondered, well, is he dreaming? Is this something that he's like? Are we about to find out this whole thing is in his head? Which I'm glad we don't. But anyway. Um, and also, last thing, they demand that he answers them. How can he answer him? His son just knocked him the fuck out. I would also not be able to answer anything. Uh, I thought, honestly, this is my favorite set of scenes in this episode. I thought they'd do a really good job here. <laughs> I know for a fact that the faucet water Grimes drank, that once he got out of that hospital bed, was the best water that man ever drank. You know, like when you wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> and you're just thirsty as can be and you got a bottle of water right there? I know that faucet water was hitting. I do kind of, I, it is kind of hard to believe that he's the only patient, only person left alone in the hospital, but I'll allow it. Uh, incredible effects with his half eaten corpse on the hospital floor. Like you mentioned, Brian, the, the effects were incredible. In my Thomas Wake voice, how long has Grimes been in this hospital? Five weeks, two days? A lot has happened since this man got admitted. This has to be a huge shock to his system. Again, more good effects with his zombie torso crawling towards Grimes while he's deboing this bicycle. And speaking of, man is built different riding a bike with no shoes on. I know that was killing his feet. It has to be gut-wrenching as a father and husband getting home and there's no signs of them being there. I thought it was great acting about him portraying his emotions. And there's no better way to end a shitty day than to take a shovel to the face. And that's all I got. Go ahead, Dustin. (laughs) So Rick wakes up inside, tied to the bed with the man, who we go on to find out his name is Morgan, and his son watching over him. The man asks again what the bandage is for. Rick tells him it's a gunshot, and that's all. He wasn't bit. The man feels Rick's forehead and says he feels cool enough. Fever would have killed him by now. He cuts Rick free and tells him to come out when he's ready, when he's able. Morgan tells Rick the house they're in was empty when they got there and not to look out the window. There's more of the more than normal outside, and he couldn't have fired he shouldn't have fired the gun earlier. Rick tells him he shot shot the man in the street, and he's told it wasn't a man, it was a walker. Morgan blesses the food and Rick tells him his timeline and learns about the walkers. Morgan tells Rick not to get bit. The fever kills you, but then you come back. After dinner, Rick tells Morgan and his son that he was a deputy and a car alarm is set off outside. We hear the kid's name is Dwayne and then we get a look outside at all the walkers. Seeing all of them sends Dwayne into a crying fit and we learn it was Dwayne's mother. The next day, the three guys head out where a walker approaches him. Rick takes him out Casey Jones style. A Jose Canseco back. You Sorry. did not pay real money for this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Brian would like that. Uh, back at Rick's house, he tells the other two that Lori and Carl are alive. They packed some clothes and took pictures off the wall. Dwayne says he bets they're in Atlanta at a refugee center. Rick grabs a set of keys, and next we see the three guys enjoying a hot shower at the police station. Rick gets to the weapon locker, and they stock up. Rick asks Morgan if he's sure they won't, they won't join him, and then gives him a radio and tells him to turn it on every day at dawn, and that's how they'll find each other. Morgan warns Rick about underestimating the walkers in a pack and they prepare to say their goodbyes when a walker approaches behind a gate. It was one of the cops who was with Rick when he was shot. Rick says he can't leave him like this and puts him down. So I didn't say last set of scenes, but Lenny James, who plays Morgan Jones here, man, I recognize recognize him right away from Blade Runner 2049, which he did not talk British in either. But uh, British, I guess it's English. I don't know why I said they don't talk British. That's not even a, that's not a fucking language. I speak bro. American. <laughs> um, but he's so good here, man. This role with him and his son being the first people we encounter. And basically, it acts like this bridge between like what's happened with catching us and Rick up and getting everything all set up from where we're going. And so not only is Lenny amazing, but you, as a writer didn't have to give that James family its own quick little plot arc. Like you really didn't. Like I said, all they are is that bridge between, you know, the past and the future. But I fucking loved that they did like that whole thing with Morgan's wife and Dwayne's mom was so well written and just, it was very effective to me. 
And another interactive part of the show here. Can I ask if we ever see these two again? Because I really hope so. Uh, so do you maybe want I me should, to tell maybe you? Maybe I shouldn't. I don't. I, never mind. I don't want to know. Don't answer. Okay. Um, anyway, very, very well written and effective little arc here with these two. Something I would have liked to have seen, though. My man Rick just got fucking knocked out with a shovel to the fur in the face. And he wakes up with no wounds from that, like at all. I would have liked to have seen something anyway, like a bandage on his nose, some dried blood. R- like, dude, dude, it's huh? R-A-S-S-L-I-N, that's wrestling. Come on, you don't need wounds. <laughs> oh, come on. Anyway, not a lot on this set of scenes, just some good character moments that, like I said, make you, or at least me, really like these two people. So I'm really hoping that they wouldn't, you know, they don't get overrun by something. And I, that's what I was hoping during this this, epi- or this episode as well, anyway. Um, all the shots to the heads of the zombies I thought were the best part of the set of scenes. They were brutal, and I loved it. Again, I'll piggyback off of what I just said. No way I wouldn't think this was a fucking dream. What the fuck is a walker? What, like, zombies are running around? Get the fuck out of my face, dog. Uh, and then they have blessing in a time like this, which I respect. I'm just saying I don't know if it would have been my first thought to bless the food, which I, uh, but again, I respect it. I'm going to go back to what I said about A Quiet Place too. This seems like a really fucking terrible existence, like a really boring, super arduous, not fun existence. And I don't want to come off as like like I'm suicidal or something. I'm just and forget my language there. But that's all I had Um, for Rick, though. His his wife and kid are still out there. He he believes. Right. I understand everybody else, though. Like, like, (laughs) man, that's tough. I don't know. I understand what you're saying, though. Um we are doing a good job in the house. I like this suspense and tension that they build in these houses, especially once all the lights go off. Uh, and the shot of the zombie woman looking into the eye hole, very creepy, very effective. I really like that shot. Um, man, as soon as he comes out with the baseball bat, I had no other choice but to, is it, it it's Sting! I can't do the Tony <laughs> Schiavone, but you know, Sting, brother. Uh, <laughs> Also, and maybe it was explained and I just missed it. It's a wild thing that Rick does to put this police uniform back on. Like, why the fuck did he go back and put the police uniform on? I thought that was funny. Um, It's because it's his clothes, which I guess he was at his house. He had clothes at his house, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, like, I don't know, man. A t-shirt and some jeans would have probably been okay. (laughs) This motherfucker goes and puts his uniform back on. Uh, Yeah, man. Anyway, I'm like you, Brian. I wanted more Morgan and Dwayne. Uh, here because I think they're great characters and I really, they kind of add a lot to this set of scenes that I don't have a ton of notes on, so that's all I got. Man, this is a set of scenes I got the most notes on. If I was Grimes waking up tied to a bed and my first sight was a kid with a bat, I would just know I'm about to get misery. You know what I'm talking about. This is a nitpick, but I actually, that's a good point, Brian, about your nitpick, like him not having any damage on his face. But my first thing was, why isn't Grimes, after all this conversation, ask Morgan what the hell is going on by now? That's the first thing I'm asking. But then, you know, they finally tell him at the dinner table, they let bro know what's going on. This would be so overwhelming to process after that hospital stay. If these zombies are attracted to light so much, why they got so many on? Y'all got a ration, folks. Turn some of them candles off. I do feel gutted for Dwayne and Morgan seeing their mom and wife as a walker. Dwayne, you got to get it together, though, brother. No time to cry. You got to leave the bad kid decisions to a quiet place, too. Don't feel bad, Morgan. I couldn't kill my wife either. But, man, I, I love Morgan. He's He stole this episode for me. Grimes goes ham on this walker with a bat, but I did get a chuckle from the noises it was making as it was getting clubbed. Morgan, <laughs> I love this guy. You can tell he really loved his wife. This is a fun scene. I can't imagine how good a hot shower feels for these guys right now. I'd be celebrating, too. I love that Morgan continues to father his son on respect, even in this intense scenario. And that was a good point. Like you mentioned, Mike, about them, you know, praying before dinner. Like they, they keep the humanity. And I like that. Soon as Dwayne as dad, can I learn to shoot? It made me think that this would be a line in Alan Jackson's new hit single drive. If he rewrote the song in the Walker outbreak era, I praise the team for the good effects all episode, but that blood did look kind of bad at the end. Whenever uh, Grimes shoots his former deputy or whatever, the blood didn't look great, but that's the first time I've had any complaints about any of the effects. So, um, Mike, to what you were saying about why did he put the uniform on, I think also I can forgive it because if he just put a T-shirt and jeans on and he shows up somewhere in a world where it's all going to hell, people are probably going to think he's a threat. 
So maybe it was a, as he meets people, they can know they can trust him. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, he feels like a little bit more of a protector of the people that aren't zombies anymore. I mean, that makes sense to me. But in the moment when I'm taking my notes, I'm like, the fuck did he do that for? That felt like a waste of time. Nico, you were talking about like, why didn't he just suddenly ask like, what the fuck's going on? I thought that too. Like at first I thought, well, maybe he's his cop training. He's kind of playing it slow, slow playing it, trying to find out what the fuck's going on. Cause these two could easily be, like you said, those misery people, just some fucking psychos trying to, you know, do whatever. And so I don't know, maybe he doesn't want to play his hand that he doesn't, that he's kind of out of touch and not, doesn't necessarily know what's going on yet. That's just kind of my head. Or maybe that fucking swing of the shovel to the face gave him CTE and he was concussed. You know, that's also plausible. He didn't know where the fuck he was. So, all right, next set of scenes. Rick and Morgan go their separate ways, and then we see Morgan boarding up the doors and Dwayne covering windows in the house. Rick goes back to where he got the bicycle, and Morgan tells Dwayne to read his comics while he goes upstairs. Rick walks through the grass searching while Morgan looks through the old photos of him and his wife. He takes a picture off uh, of his wife and tapes it to the window and pulls up a chair and grabs a gun. Rick finds the half corpse from earlier, crawling in the grass and approaches it with a studious look. Morgan starts shooting corpses in the street and tells Dwayne to stay downstairs. Rick apologizes to the half corpse and then shoots it in the face. A herd of walkers approaches Morgan's house now and he sees his wife fighting back tears. He tries to muster up the strength to take her out, but he just can't do it. Rick drives down highway 85 calling out for others on the radio where a group hears him, but the reception's bad and he can't hear them. We then see Shane grab the radio and try to talk to Rick, but no luck. A woman tells Shane they should have put up signs warning people to avoid the city. The group argues, and a woman storms off with Shane following her, telling her she has to stay cool for her son. The two get back in the same on the same page and share a kiss in a tent that's interrupted by her son. Back in Rick's car, a picture in the sun visor shows that woman and her kid. It was Lori and Carl. Dun, dun, dun. The plot thickens. Rick exits the car with a gas can in hand and finds a house. Go ahead. Next set of scenes are the ending. Yeah, again, just very effective montage here at the start of the set of scenes with Rick going back to shoot the bicycle girl and how it just intertwined with Morgan trying and failing to shoot his wife. Again, just an amazing performance from Lenny James there. Very emotional, great acting. Now, when Rick is trying to get in touch with anyone on the CB and Amy answers it, I was like, holy shit, it's Emma Bell. Now her third appearance on our show after Final Destination 5 and Frozen Shout out to Emma, by the way. A little behind the scenes story that I don't even know if you guys know about. But I touched base with Emma two years ago, back in 2022, right before we did Final Destination 5 review. Don't go out there.com. And I asked her to come on the show or do any intro, whatever she possibly could. And I never heard back. Just thought she ghosted us like a whole bunch of other people did. But fast forward to January of 24, almost two years later coincidentally this is drake this is god's plan right here coincidentally the exact week that we are recording the frozen episode and i get an email out of the blue with mp3 file uh, for her responding with a clip for the intro not only amazing timing but that says a lot about her and her love you know for her fans to which i'm definitely now a very big one so shout out emma bell who i had no idea was in this very nice pleasure nice surprise what I meant to say there. Very nice pleasure. Shut up, okay. shut up Mike. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> now, now look, I immediately knew this was Rick's wife and kid, even though they never said their names. And, you know, it's because I've seen this plot line play out before in Pearl Harbor and that movie Brothers with Tobey Maguire. And look, this isn't podcast related, really. But without going too much into detail, this plot line really affects me because of some other shit that happened in my real life. So I immediately knew that this was coming during the set of scenes. And I almost had to use the jump ahead 10 seconds thing because, number one, it agitates me that it's not immediately fulfilled. Like Rick doesn't immediately know, but it bothers me on like a whole nother level. And I know it isn't Shane's fault. He thought Rick was dead, but it makes me have hatred for Shane and some for Lori that I can't really even describe. So like I said, I know that's not good review talk, but just know that it really fucking affects me and shout out to Sarah Callies too, because I've only ever seen her in prison break. And I I do know she's a great actress. So I'm going to touch on that real quick. That's one of my biggest problems with this show is how quickly Lori was, you know, that makes you think Lori and Shane had something going on before shit went down because Rick couldn't have survived 
like plausibly, how long can you survive in a hospital right. in a coma or whatever he was and uh, and you know no power and then he wakes up? He couldn't have been in there too long. And right, so exactly. not enough time has passed, even if he was dead, to start fucking his partner. Go ahead. Boom. Right. No, man, I, I would have a hard time killing a friend here like Rick did, or at least a colleague, unless they just like really fucking pissed me off before they became a zombie. Uh, but that would be tough. Uh, wherever they're – and I know they're in Georgia, you know, quote-unquote Georgia. Uh, it's beautiful. It looks like a beautiful spring there, spring leading into summer, a lot of greenery. Uh, flowers and stuff. It looks beautiful. Um, it, man, the hat that crawling woman is fucking wild. Great effects. Love the way that looks. Uh, I, I feel so bad for, for Dwayne in these set of scenes. He's a kid, but in a world like this, you can't over protect them by like, Hey, go downstairs. Let me take care of this upstairs. Like you got to kind of teach them the ways earlier than you would like to, to survive. And I think that emotion there really worked for me, Jen Hem and Morgan. Um, look, I know it's you know the the uh, you know late odds, early tens here. Cell phones were a thing. The CB works, but no one's got a cell phone. Okay, all right. Anyway, um, one of the most wild discoveries. I remember my first initial reaction to finding out about Shane and Lori and everything. Like just jaw on the floor and we'll, to revisit it i'm like ah you sons of you sons of bitches because like you said brian i don't necessarily and and i understand what you're saying dustin it makes it look like there was something going on okay um prior but i also understand like it's not necessarily shane's fault like maybe it started as like hey i found you guys i'm gonna protect you you know i'm gonna watch over i know i know I'm just saying what it could have started as was mm. I'm going to protect you guys. And then eh, I think I'm going to have, well, spoiler, I'm going to fuck you in a forest. Okay. That's where, it, eh, that's where it eventually led to. But I'm just saying like, maybe it started in eventually, a eventually yeah. led to over the course of like a week. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I didn't, Hey, Hey, we thought earlier in the episode, they were on the outs, you know, Rick and Laura were doing so hot. That's I'm a best kidding. friend, though. I'm kidding, dude. I'm not. I'm not defending it. I fucking hate it. Uh, you don't and mow like another Ryan, man's lawn. I agree. Uh, anyway, really good set of scenes, and because of that reveal, you're like, God damn, this already has like the heaviest stakes possible because you're watching Rick struggle to get to them, and now we see where they are and know their setting, and it, it is just wild. Man, my first initial thoughts were just the writers weren't holding back in episode one, were they? This is extremely emotional with Morgan looking at his wife's pictures. I wish they would have had Boulevard or Broken Dreams playing while Grimes is walking through the woods all alone. That would have been, that would have hit so perfectly. Shout out to Lenny James. This man is giving a hell of a performance. The zombie torso looks great, but more bad CGI blood as Grimes puts her out of her misery. I couldn't do it either, Morgan. Don't feel bad. I will continue to praise your acting. This is gut wrenching. I don't blame you for not shooting her at all. That's a bar, Walsh. We don't have time. We are surviving. I thought that was a really good line. This is, but this is shitty of Walsh and Lori. Holy shit. That's your partner's wife you're making out with, Chief. Bro code. People are horrible. Nice little transition shot that grinds putting the family picture in his coat, but only if you knew, my friend. Uh, ending this set of scenes with it doesn't make any sense to drop all your weapons, but the visual of the house was great. All right, guys. Here's the ending Rick approaches the house asking to borrow some gas, but it appears no one's home. Through a window, Rick sees flies buzzing and God forgive us written on the wall in blood before seeing a man with a self-inflicted gun, uh, shotgun wound to the head and on the couch, a dead woman, or he's on the couch with a bullet wound to his head and a dead woman is on the floor beside him. Rick takes a seat outside to collect himself, then tries to steal the guy's truck, but can't find the keys. So in true Georgia country boy fashion, he mounts up on a horse and heads off. We get a great overhead shot of Rick riding the horse down the middle of the interstate lane and we see abandoned cars, as far as the eye can see, heading out from Atlanta. There's no cars heading into town. Rick rides into the city, and it's a ghost town. Abandoned wreckage is everywhere, and it's eerily quiet. As he rides past a bus, some of the dead bodies inside start rising and walking towards him. He sees a dead soldier corpse on a tank being picked at by some birds and continues the search. He stops when he hears a helicopter flying, and we see its reflection on the windows of a building. 
He takes off on his horse looking for it, but rides around a corner into a massive herd of walkers. When he's surrounded, he's thrown from the horse and crawls under the tank for safety. The horse wasn't as lucky. Under the tank, he starts sh- uh, shouting the walkers, shooting the walkers, but it looks like he's fucked. He apologizes to Lori and Carl as he puts his revolver to his own head before noticing a door in the bottom of the tank. He crawls up inside to safety, and when a dead soldier inside comes back to life, Rick shoots him in the head. The echo from inside the tank stuns him for a while, and then he climbs out on top of the tank to see his bag of guns in the street. The tank is sworn by walkers, though, so he has to retreat back inside and close the hatch. After collecting himself for a minute, he hears a man on uh, the radio call him a dumbass, and the episode ends as we see the poor horse getting eaten by walkers and the tank being surrounded by walkers in a cool overhead shot. Well, I don't think he crawled under the tank. I think he Rick rolled under the tank. Ooh. Hey, Never gonna I just came, I just yeah. came up with that shit. There we go. All right. Uh, another very effective scene was Rick approaching the White House. Uh, the effects, not the White House, the White House. But anyway, the effects on those two people were, I thought, holy shit, amazing. And even with no dialogue, you can immediately tell what happened. And I mean, wow, I mean, it was effective. That was very effective to me. Great fucking work there. Now, I don't know how big of a fan of I am uh, really of him like riding a horse. I think that was more for the visuals of him riding a horse into a seemingly ghost town of Atlanta. And admittedly, it probably hit better. It was a better choice from simply just, be, you know, because of him uh, walking up or riding up on that tank with a horse. Huh? But but I just kept thinking, like, has that horse been eaten? Or has that, yeah, has has it been eating, not been eaten? Has it been eating? Has it been drinking? Did you give him some fucking water? How long has he been in that corral? How many miles on the fucking concrete did you just ride him? Couldn't have ridden him in the grass? Jesus Christ, you fucking asshole. Like, that's, sorry, that's that's the kind of stuff that was going through my head that entire time. And I never read the Robert Kirkman comic book series that this was based on. So maybe that's ripped straight from there. I don't know. It kind of seems like something that would be written in the card, you know, a picture in a comic book. But I wasn't totally in love with the choice here. Just coming and watching the show. Uh, my favorite kill of the series so far, Soldier in the Tank. Uh, something I did notice here, though, too. Remember, I, I've had an issue with people not really eating in scenes like Big Bang Theory. I've brought that up before. None of these zombies eat any of this horse. They just like bring up the food to their mouths and then put it down. Like maybe that's like a TV ratings thing. I don't know. But if so, that's dumb as fuck. But I don't know. I noticed it. But yeah, we're, we're left on a great cliffhanger, which I'm going to guess happens in every episode of the series since it was a weekly episodic release when it first came out. Thankfully, I don't have to wait, you know, before I can really check out at least the next one or two. And look, I do get, and Nico kind of touched on this earlier, I do get that it's not really realistic that Rick would have survived in the hospital this whole time in a coma with no power. Like, But that's one of those movie things that don't really bother me. Like, I love this episode. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to do the next one. And I didn't really notice, but you were talking about that time passage in that hospital with the flowers. They didn't look that dead. So it really hadn't been that long, I didn't feel like. So, yeah, you're right about the Shane shit. Fair. <laughs> Fair. Um, man, I feel so bad for this horse. You know it's a horse that has seen some crazy shit, heard some crazy shit, and horses are smart animals, and they, 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 they are very emotional, too. They're very aware of the stuff that goes on around them. Fucking, it would, I know it would spook that horse the fuck out, all the shit that's gone down there. Um, the shot of him walking down the interstate with the buildings in the back is fucking brilliant. I love Love, love the way they got that shot. Uh, it, <laughs> speaking of Atlanta, is this where Dustin went a few weeks back? Oh, my bad. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, um, I love this scene a lot. The city backdrop with the with only the sound of the horse hooves hitting the concrete. I thought it was brilliant. Um, man, you mentioned it being your favorite kill in the episode. Me fucking too, buddy. This kill in the tank is awesome. Caught me off guard, which I kind of expected when I saw him. I was like, you know, eh. but I, no, man, I fucking love it. I love the soldier waking up like this and bam, I thought it was a great scene. Um, <laughs> is that tank out of gas? Because if it's not, I'm driving that motherfucker like Bill Dotry. I am getting this motherfucker out of here. Uh, like, I love how this episode ends. The CB radio, you know, seeing him. 
tapping into him. The song, it's awesome. I fucking love it. Poor horse, though, man. I don't want to see that shit. That man, that made me sad. Sad ending there, but a badass, also a badass. So two things can be true at once. All right, my first thoughts were, oh, my God, what a way to start this set of scenes off. God forgive us in blood on the wall and a murder-suicide. Really powerful visual. And what a haunting shot seeing the highway full of abandoned cars and it completely empty the way Grimes is traveling. The ravens eating a corpse is an underrated horror staple. A raven's call is a spooky-ass sound. I'd pull an insert co-host I won't name when I turned the corner on this street and saw an army of walkers. <laughs> I used this phrase last week, and I'll use it again. Grimes makes chicken salad out of chicken shit, crawling under this tank and then into it. I don't know how that man pulled it off. That was some MacGyver stuff. Good for him. And I feel Rick you, Rowan. Grimes. Guns are loud as hell. I'd be disoriented as hell. Probably should have tried a different method of killing that soldier, brother. I'd be thankful to be alive, but that must be, that must feel completely hopeless. You got walkers over, around, and under you. How do you get out of this alive? But I will say I've never be so thankful to be called a dumbass hearing that radio go off. We get more great effects as the walkers eat the horse. But that was a good point, Brian. I didn't really notice it. They, they don't actually eat the horse meat or whatever. And I thought it was a great ending shot of all these walkers as the camera ascends into the air. This was a really good first episode of a series I'd never seen. I'm really impressed. Yeah, agreed. All right. So, like I said, I love the early seasons of this show, and this episode is what got me hooked. I think the pacing is great, and they do a great job at establishing the backstory throughout instead of just all at once in the beginning. I really like that. It's like little wrinkles keep unfolding during the story story that make it more and more interesting. Phenomenal debut for a show. Uh, While the special effects are not fantastic, especially on, like you said, Brian, the uh, bicycle girl, and I think the, the zombie looks, which, fun fact, Never in the 11 seasons of the show do we hear the word zombie. So there's that. Oh, but um, well, I think the special effects are fantastic. My biggest gripe, Nico, you mentioned it, the CG blood after Rick shoots the, the corpses or the, the walkers. Yeah. It looks bad. But other than yeah, that, I, I loved it. Well, you you brought it up. It's almost like a this first episode was almost like a movie. You know, it's yeah. like a... <laughs> I don't want to say mini series, but you know how sometimes they'll give you yeah. like a in between length of an episode and and movie where they'll suck you in. This one definitely does that. It, yeah. Man, you mentioned the pacing, which is something I meant to touch on. It has just enough rev up, bring it back down, rev it up again. Like I really love the pacing of this episode. I completely agree. Did you say the fun fact, Brian? No, I've got one. Uh, the only th- it's just real quick with audiences in excess of five million. This was at the time the most watched series premiere in AMC's history. Five million is crazy, I think. It really is. All right, let's get into episode two Guts. We open with a man named Dale standing atop an RV, and then we see the camp of survivors going about daily tasks. And Lori tells Dale that she's heading out and tells Carl to stay with the camp. She goes into the woods, and every noise around her dra- draws her attention. We get a look through the trees, implying that she's being watched. And after she's spooked out by some more generic woods racket, a man, a man's hand grabs her mouth and takes her to the ground. It's Shane. They laugh it off and get some post-apocalyptic coitus in, with, in which the two-timing hussy takes off her necklace with Rick's wedding ring on it. On the other side of our opening credits, we get a great overhead shot of the downtown Atlanta scene and the tank where Rick is holed up. He communicates with the man through the radio who tells him he's completely surrounded and tells him to make a run for it. He's told his bag of guns isn't an option, so all he has is a Beretta with 15 rounds in it. The man gives him some record uh, directions, and Rick takes off. He takes out a walker on the tank with a shovel and shoots a few others before turning a corner and meeting his guide from the radio. They run down an alley and head up a ladder, where we learn these zombies can't climb. The two make a formal introduction, and we learn the man's name is Glenn. They climb up to the roof and then navigate to another building, where Glenn tells someone he's got a guest. When they get to the next alley... There's some walkers waiting for them, but two men in riot suits run out and take them down with baseball bats. When the two men meet up with the rest of Glenn's group, Andrea is pissed off at Rick for endangering them and pulls a gun on him and tells him he rang the dinner bell. The doors to the department store they're in are crowded with countless walkers. They tell Rick he imagined the helicopter and there is no refugee center. We hear gunshots from outside and they head to the roof where we see Merle Dixon shooting a rifle. T-Dog scolds him for firing the gun. And we learn Merle has an issue with the non-whites. He drops the N-word and T-Dog loses his cool. And then Merle beats the shit out of him. Merle votes himself the new leader. But Rick knocks him out with the butt of the rifle and handcuffs him to a pipe. He tells Merle there is no whites and blacks anymore. Only dead and undead. 
He tells Merle he's just a man looking for his wife and son and that anyone who gets in his way of that will lose. That's the opening set of scenes. What do you guys think? Whew, a lot happening here. Fun fact, Michelle McLaren actually directed this episode. If you recognize the name, she's a producer and director known for Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, and the fucking X-Files. Put some respect on Michelle's name for sure. But anyway, this cold open back at the camp, I will admit, the second time I watched this for notes, I did use that 10-second skip a bunch during this set because, like I mentioned last set of scenes, I mean, this plot line really bothers me. So seeing Shane and Lori fucking in the woods and that just that little touch of her pulling off her necklace with Rick's ring on it was a little much for me to handle, so I had to do it. Uh, fun fact I found out, though, was that Lori and Shane's relationship in the comics was only a one-night stand in issue five, by the way. Not necessarily the longer one portrayed here, so. Uh, so I said I'd never seen an episode of this series, and that's very true. But I have, for some reason, seen a clip of Glenn from God knows what season hiding under a dumpster. And I remember there was some big controversy about him dying or not dying. So I was a little, it was a little jarring, first of all, for me to see him as a kid. But I was like, oh shit, okay. You know, I was kind of like, okay, well, I don't feel like he's ever in any danger because I know he lives and I'm through it. So that's one thing that I'm going to have to battle through. Uh, with this series and the tension anyway. A little nitpick though, I'll say Glenn is using a CB radio to communicate with Rick in the tank who is using a military radio. And I know for a fact that that's not possible because they use different frequency ranges. Does that matter? No, but that's what we do on this show. Uh, also another stupid thing I do. That, that's my favorite Kate, nerdiest fun fact that has ever been spouted on the show. I love that. <laughs> well, wait till my next one. Oh, uh, this is a, this is a you one though. This is kind of you. Uh, because another, I, I do this when characters in movies or shows make it a point to say how many bullets they have left. Like when he, like here, when he says he has 15, for some reason that immediately makes me count. And unless I missed one, he only shot 14 times and it runs out. So just saying. Um, yep. Shout out Michael Rooker with his first appearance. I had no idea he was in the show either. Mike and Nico obviously know him from Guardians of the Galaxy without question. Yeah. Don't even have to ask them. John do. Um, and holy shit, we're dropping the N bombs on AMC in 2010. That is wild. Go ahead. Yeah, and it was a big fucking deal too. I I, I remember it being a pretty big deal. Um, I will say, and this is a nitpick, and this isn't just about this show. Every like post apocalyptic thing that there is has like some human compound where all the humans, I guess, ever have flocked to this one little area to try to survive. It is very formulaic but i mean i don't i don't not like it it kind of feels like a nitpick but i'm just saying i've noticed that now that that i mean we did quiet place too recently and now we're doing the walking dead like very and and warm bodies as well so i mean we've done a lot of this here in a short period of time man you know goddamn well that's your buddy's wife and you still go through it that man like that is just uh i will say dustin aren't you the one that supported juno in the descent but we're going to call out Shane? Is it because Juno's hot? No, it's because Dustin's rules only apply to Dustin and not <laughs> or only apply to y'all and not me. There we go. Okay. At least you were honest about it because this ain't no fucking different, pal. Why are you bringing up old shit? <laughs> because you brought up old shit on the time that we fucking, God damn it! what's that movie we covered? The fucking Shining sequel that's not very good. I can't think of the name of off the top of my head. Doctor, doctor Put Me to Sleep. That one is very good, so that's definitely not it. <laughs> oh, okay, sure, pal. Anyway, um, but in all in all, Mike settle ways that I can be, Lori, call me sometime. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this motherfucker Rick hopped out, and all of a sudden, even John Claude Van Dam. I know he's a trained police officer, but man, come on, dude. Like, all right, man. Anyway, look, I get our woman's problem here, bringing Rick in. I really do. Because he basically, he basically just brought the plague into our little hideout, which I understand the frustration there. The N-word, I do remember that being a big deal at the time, like I already mentioned. Uh, no one would really have cared if it were a show that sh was on a streaming platform, but back then, it was kind of a big fucking deal. Um, <laughs> Rick immediately stepped up and became a boss, man. <laughs> he, he, he came in their trap and took over their trap with the quickness. I thought that was pretty badass and established the kind of character that Rick is going forward. I liked it. 
All right, I'll be honest. I don't have a lot of notes on this entire episode. Maybe it's just because it was so entertaining, so much was going on. But the opening shot, I thought, was very Texas Chainsaw Massacre-esque following this lady's backside. I thought that was a really good shot. And it, you know, obviously reminded me of a movie I really like. I don't know how this show transpires, but seeing Lori and Shane hooking up, it just disgusts me. And getting your face shoved into the grass is absolutely nasty work. That was an intense alley scene. I'm not a big fan of heights either, so climbing that ladder would have been absolutely horrifying. And like y'all have mentioned, I was not expecting the N-word with the hard ER to be dropped as casually as it was then. It really caught me off guard. And this is the last thing I got. Good for Grimes overtaking the situation. And to be honest, I would just leave that piece of shit Merle handcuffed there and let him die. (laughs) Rick finds some drugs in Merle's pocket and tosses it off the roof. And then Morales welcomes Rick to the big city. And we get a great shot of the walkers in the street below. The group has no signal on the radio, and Merle tries to seduce Andrea and calls her a lesbian when she rejects his advances. I thought that was kind of funny. Jackie tells the group there should be a uh, drainage tunnel in the basement and that she used to work in the city's zoning office. little convenient. The group heads to the basement where they find a ladder, and they want Glenn to go down and check it out. He says he'll only take one person, but not Rick. They need him covering the group. He takes Morales, and they see a nasty-ass rat. I'd be heading back up. Back in the store, Andrea apologizes for pulling a gun on Rick, and he tells her next time to take the safety off if she wants to use it. Up on the roof, t Dog continues trying the radio, and he and Merle continue developing their lovely relationship. Merle tries to sweet-talk t Dog into helping him and says it wasn't personal before, just that their kinds aren't meant to mix. Back in the basement, Morales and Glenn find a tunnel, but it's blocked off by rebar, and there's a walker inside eating a rat. Yuck. Back in the store, Andrea is checking out some jewelry for her sister, and Rick tells her looting rules don't apply anymore. Their moment is ruined by the walkers making progress, breaking through the doors, and Andrea says they need to find a way out soon. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't have a lot on this set of scenes, but man, right at the start of this, when Rick throws Merle's drugs off the roof, the way Rick flicks him in the nose when he says he has some left on it, like, that was so damn effective, and apparently that was something done on the day between Rooker and Lincoln, and such a nice little touch. Oh, and another little tidbit, too, here, while he was handcuffed to the rooftop, you know, when Merle asked for T-Dog to give him the hacksaw and the bag so that he could cut himself free from the pike, telling T-Dog he can be all sunny sunshine afterwards, that's actually a reference made to real-life actor Ernest Frederick Nett, who is an African-American child actor who performed under the stage name Sunshine Sammy. Is this an inappropriate time to say that was my nickname in college? Good. Uh, the only thing I really noticed this set of scenes I wanted to point out is like most zombie movies, the zombies are dumb, slow idiots. But when that zombie in this set of scenes used a rock to break through the first set of doors, I thought, holy shit, okay, because, I mean, that clearly shows intelligence and reasoning to an extent. But doing research for this, I saw where that was kind of controversial at the time, and that when they switched showrunners in season two and on, the walkers kind of become a more traditional you know, just slow idiots in subsequent seasons. So something I thought was interesting since again, I hadn't seen any other episodes or seasons. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that real quick, Brian, uh, before you go on, because there are certain things that happen in this episode. I've got something else in my notes here in the scene by scene that they completely abandon. And so you can look at it one of two ways. Either they listen to the crowd and they're like, okay, that is controversial. Zombies don't do that. Traditionally, let's stop. Or I took it as the longer that goes, the more rot the brain becomes. And so they okay. lose that yeah. ability. They become more primal. That's, good that's, are, you that's talking about when he, are you talking about when he climbs the fence? Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I was wondering that too. I was like, Oh shit. Like how are they going to keep him out of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Fair. Here's a question. Why don't you throw away another man's drugs? You know, we're living in a zombie world now. It is just going to take this man's drugs off. Him. I know he said the N word. I'm just saying, man, we, we, we don't have to take his drug. Um, Again, I think the city makes for a really interesting setting. Some of the scenes, especially on the rooftop, and I maybe Brian felt the same, remind me of Dawn of the Dead remake. Like, that is literally where my brain went. I'm like, man, this is like straight out of that. I really enjoyed it. Um, LOL to the nickname Sugar Tits. I think that's funny no matter who it's used on. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great name to call someone. I will say, maybe not a first-round draft pick. But having someone that worked in the zoning office would be a fucking steal in your zombie universe draft team. Like that would be maybe not first round, but maybe late on the second day if she's hanging around, you snatch her up. Now you got someone that knows all the where everything is. That's a pretty smart move in my opinion. 
Um, you know, again, early second round, late second round, somewhere around there. Um, I know there are zombies running around, but I immediately, and I know Dustin probably feels the same, immediately it's a big fuck no to these rats that are running around. Like, zombie, yeah. I'll try to whip your ass. Rats, no thank you. Fuck off. Um, man, last thing. Mr. Racist and my and, and my black guy here getting along a little bit on the on the rooftop. I didn't particularly like that. <laughs> but uh, no, I think it's a good set of scenes. I didn't have as much as as I usually do as well. All right, Merle is an animal, but I did chuckle him calling Andrea a rug muncher. Thought that was funny. <laughs> Group of people on the roof of a building looking onto a sea of zombies is horror cliche, but it is effective in making the viewer feel completely hopeless. And man, I love to see an Asian man taking charge. Glenn, you my favorite character already, brother. Me and Dustin are immediately hating life seeing these giant rats in the tunnel. Early instincts tells me Grimes and Andrea hook up. Seems like she has the feels for him right off that look. Don't spoil it, but she did give him that look. Jump scare, that would be a real mood killer seeing that walker and the sewer barricaded off. You feel like you've gotten so far, but in the end, it really didn't matter. (laughs) <laughs> Andrew seems like a sweetheart asking the cop if he's looting, wanting to take the jewelry for his sister. And I'm just going to reiterate what I said earlier. I really like that this show keeps the humanity with the characters and like their moral compass. I really like that. On the roof again, Rick scopes the scene with some binoculars and develops a plan to distract the walkers below. They establish that the walkers can tell the living by the smell and a plan is birth. Back in the store, Rick is handing out clothing and the group says this is a bad idea. Rick and Morales head outside and grab one of the dead walkers and pull the body inside. Rick hacks up the corpse with an axe, but not before looking at it or looking at his ID and learning the walker's name, birth date, and contents of his wallet. Glenn points out that the man was an organ donor, and Rick gets to hacking. Rick tells the group not to get any on their skin or in their eyes, and the group covers himself with walker innards, which makes Glenn hurl. T-Dog asks about Merle, and Rick gives him the keys to the handcuffs. Rick and Glenn head outside covered in zombie guts, and their plan works. The walkers let them pass freely. The rest of the group runs back upstairs to the roof, and Rick and Glenn crawl under a bus to the main street. Back up on the roof, Morales tells T-Dog to try the radio again, which begs the question. With them, when they were down there hacking up the walker, T-Dog was there, but was he also on the roof at the same time? Like, he was seated with the, with the radio and Merle like he was when we saw him earlier. Continuity exactly. error much? And that's, wh- <laughs> and that's when they handed he handed him the key downstairs, but then he's suddenly back at the top with the key. Back up, yep. Exactly. Yep. As Thunder starts rolling in, Morales uh, spots Rick and Glenn, and T-Dog shows Merle that he has the keys to his freedom. That's the next set of scenes. The next is the ending. What would you guys think? Honestly, all I could think about during this idea with the acting like the zombies was Shaun of the Dead. I mean, so, yeah, I know that's kind of like scary movie effect on Scream, but since I saw that first, unfortunately, that's all I could think about. But there was another little issue the editing people either caused or missed the continuity people didn't catch. But when they're all in the back of the store chopping up that dead body to use its guts, Rick hands the axe to Morales, who then starts chopping the body into pieces. Just before the camera angle cuts in the middle of this, the visor Morales is wearing clearly falls off his head, but is right back on it in the following shot. So it is what it is. Uh, I did laugh at Rick saying old dude was an organ donor right before chopping him up. I mean, that's that's a great dad joke there. Some. And by the way, it was some absolutely gross, and by gross, I mean great effects on that body, too, while they're being, you know, axe chopper from way back. Dustin, another interactive part of the show. How would you yeah. rate their form on these swings, given your axe chopping history? Well, you know, like you said, I'm a wood chopper from way back. I think they did okay. I probably, you know, you don't need to take such uh, such long hacks with it. I think they could have sufficed with, with shorter strokes. That way they don't tucker out as easily. But, yeah, it, it was efficient. That's game, hey, hey man, that's game tape breakdown right there. That does, and that's what you come here for. Uh, again, the wide shots of the streets I think are brilliant. It captures the chaos really well, which I've already talked about in this episode, so I won't go into detail that I have written here. But we used to use gold medal in the Bad Olympics line all the time in my friends group. Like that is something that stuck with us from this show that I still use to this day. Um, and again, like Nico's mentioned, these people keep their humanity. So this would be really hard. What happens in the set of scenes? They were real people just like us. And they do a good job of like, there's some humor in this set of scenes. Sure. Or in this episode, but when it gets to the real stuff like this, I mean, 
it's the opposite of warm bodies where stuff's kind of played for laughs until towards the very end where that has some heart. This is not that. And, and I think they do a good job with the serious stuff as well as the funny stuff. Um, look, I am not in favor of doing this dead guy meat coat thing. Absolutely fucking not, man. Uh, especially now that Rick pulled his wallet out and we got all emotional. We know who he is. Nah, man, that bleh, it makes me gag just to think about it. It's a smart plan. I'm not knocking the plan. I just think, man, that's not something I'd want to do. And I love finding out my man had this key or, or he has, or, or he had this key the whole time. I thought that was fun. So anyway, that, that's all I had. All right. I'm just going to reiterate my last statement. I really appreciate, like we've been talking about, like I've been saying, how they give the show humanity to the characters. I really appreciated Grimes giving Wayne a nice send off. If I ever see my family, I'm going to tell them about Wayne. I thought that was a great line. I love that scene. And then Glenn, he had a great line as well, you know, with some comedy, like you mentioned, Mike. Last thing, he was an organ donor. I thought that was a really cool line. Right, great. And yeah. I got, you know, that Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the TV meme, a high moment. I remember during Warm Bodies, Dustin telling us they did this during The Walking Dead. This is smart thinking. But <laughs> if it were me, though, I wouldn't get those blood and guts anywhere within like six inches to a foot of my face. I appreciate Grimes and Glenn's dedication, but I don't think it was necessary to put an entire small intestine around your neck. And uh, I was like, oh, shit. Thunder is the last thing these guys need to hear. And I'm going to end my thoughts on this. To misquote Luke Bryan, rain is not a good thing. <laughs> to misquote him? <laughs> That's hilarious you said that. Uh, Back at the survivor's camp where Lori and Carl are, Dale works on the RV and the rest of the group continue their daily routine. Shane is showing Carl how to tie knots and we hear a T-Dog come across the radio. He tells Dale they're in deep shit, but the connection is like having Verizon in Tallahassee. Terrible. Shane says that they can't go after them and tells Amy that Andrea knew the risks. Rick and Glenn continue their walk down the road through a gaggle of geeks when the worst thing imaginable happens. I don't care what Luke Bryan says. Rain is not a good thing in this situation. That's hilarious. He said that. <laughs> the rain starts to wash off their bloody disguise and the walkers start noticing that their lunch is walking among them. Rick delivers a hell of an ax blow to a walker's skull and they have to make a run for it. They fight their way through and run to a fence where they're able to climb to safety In a shocking turn of events. The walkers are, are able to climb here and one makes its way over the fence and gives Glenn a good scare at the door of the uh, moving truck. They're, they commandeered the walkers climbing abilities uh, here are not consistent with the rest of the show, but that's okay. The herd knocks down the chain link fence uh, to get into the parking lot where Rick and Glenn are able to make an escape. The group on the roof fears that they they're being left behind, but Rick says he needs to make noise and draw the group of walkers away from the store. He starts bashing in car windows to set off alarms and hot wires to dodge challenger for Glenn. Fun fact that was actually Nico's car. He radios the group to meet them at the roll-up doors uh, at the front of the store. Merle panics and says not to leave him there as the group makes a run for the door. T-Dog stops and goes back for him, but in truly comical fashion, he drops the handcuff key down a pipe. Merle says he did it on purpose, and T-Dog apologizes. He locks the door to the roof and runs down the stairs towards the others. Glenn speeds by, alarm blaring, and draws the walkers away. I don't know why the quote, Asians can't drive stereotype exists because Glenn disproves that with some nifty maneuvering behind the wheel. The walkers at the store's front break their way inside and it's a near escape as the herd reaches the group just as they get into the back of Rick's truck. We see Merle up on the roof throwing a tantrum, rightfully so, and T-Dog tells the group he dropped a key. Andrea asks where Glenn is and we see him haul ass and down the interstate in his new whip and our credits roll. All right, so in this set, when Rick and Glenn go after the truck, there is a thunderstorm with rain. Obviously rain because that's the fucking plot point of it, washing the zombie juice off of them. But just after it ends, the streets are still just bone dry. I mean, I guess it could have just been really fucking hot living in Florida in the summer. I mean, I've kind of seen that shit happen. So maybe that's a goof. Maybe that's just. Well, they don't it call really it hot for out. nothing, Bubba. There you go. Um, I thought Emma Bell did a great here when her and Shane kind of have it out when they, they uh, find out that the group and therefore her sister is trapped. Have I mentioned I love Emma Bell? I don't know. If I, I just just thought about that. Uh, now, while I did figure out that was Rick's wife and son there, I didn't put two and two together that that group in Atlanta and Shane's group were one and the same. So when I found that out, it excited me because I kind of feel like that that reunion has to be coming soon. I mean, I enjoyed this episode not as much as I did the first one, 
But, you know, I'm ready to see that reunion, like I said, and I assume them showing Merle means Rooker's story isn't done. I don't know, but I'm ready to hit up episodes three and four for sure. Man, the way that Shane almost, like, is acting like this kid's dad, like, like this quick, like, oh, that, God, that rubbed me the wrong way. I fucking hated it. I, I already hate Shane, <laughs> even though some of it's not justified, I guess. I don't know. Maybe there's just a different way to look after another man's child. That's all. Um, I will say, and Shane kind of comes off as a psycho here. Like, like he's in, you know, he's kind of like the big bad guy, like in charge, like starting to see some shades of a different kind of Shane, man. Um, again, I think it's fucking hilarious. This shot of them walking the streets with all the, all the fucking zombie guts hanging on them. I thought that was fucking funny, man. Um, especially, especially once Glenn starts making like fake zombie noises. <laughs> oh God. I thought it was, I thought it was hilarious. Um, again, I would have quote unquote dropped the key for this guy too. Fuck that. You call me the wrong word at the wrong time. We're out of here. We're leaving your ass. Um, and again, there's been some humor in this episode, but we are back to creating tension. I'm not, I'm not as big of a fan of, the zombies being able to jump a fence, but that's just me. Uh, and I really liked everything in this scene, even as they drive away. And I would be like Glenn too. If there was nobody on the roads, but zombies and I have a fast ass car, I'm taking off. I'm doing 90, hundred, whatever it takes. I'm not stopping for nothing. I thought it was fun. Fun way to end the episode. All right. Shout out to Amy. I think Shane is a son of a bitch too. I get safety, but man seems to only care about himself. I'm just going to compliment the entire makeup department here. There are 18 listed on IMDb. I won't name them all, but great job with the look of the walkers. These boys smooth with it. It's not easy hopping a fence that quick. I thought that was really impressive. Two episodes in, I got to give Grimes his flowers. That's a smart son of a bitch. He's resourceful. And I just wrote down T-Dog. Ha, 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 ha. What are the chances he falls, drops the key, and it falls into that drain? But I'd leave Merle, though. No question. He's a he's an animal. He's a piece of shit. Good on the team. We love when a plan comes together. That was flawless execution getting out of that building. And like I mentioned just a second ago, I don't feel bad for Merle per se, but seeing him handcuffed on the top of that roof, God, that's got to feel so hopeless. And uh, I just thought it was a fun ending with Glenn cruising down the empty interstate. Yeah, I think like it was comical. Like I said, though, when he dropped the way he dropped the key, like you said, it just so happened to go down that pipe. I think the the better way to write that was he tosses in the key, but before he gets it unlocked, T Dog runs to the door, closes it, and locks him locks him on the roof. So at least he's free, but he's fucked at the same time. I don't know. So I'll give my my thoughts on it. We can do any trivia, or I'll let Nico close the show. So just like the first episode, this one hooked me. The drama and character development are top notch, as are the effects used on the walkers and the gore. I'm fully invested in the show at this point. I love it. And the only fun fact I had on this one kind of plays off the last episode. This was the actually the lowest rated episode of season one with only 4.7 million viewers, which I'll say only sarcastically because Jesus fucking Christ, that's crazy to me because that is a ton of viewers. And this was the lowest watched episode. So that's crazy. Man, most shows that aren't live sports pretty much average around one to two million viewers now. Like that is just not how the world works these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was also 2010. So, did, yep. you know, so that factors into it, but you mentioned it right. being the That's lowest rated right. show as far as TV ratings uh, on IMDb. The first episode got a 9.2 second one got an 8.6. The lowest rated episodes or our season or episode three and episode five, but they're still over an eight. So wow. this entire first season is, very highly regarded. It's it's money for sure. I, I don't have any fun facts or anything like that. I'll just say, Dustin, I think these first two episodes, they were I, I enjoyed both of them. They were very different tonally wise. Like first one, I was really emotional with uh, can't even remember his name, but with with his wife, God, that that was brutal. Oh, and the second episode Morgan. was just Morgan. That's right. Very emotional, man. It, it, it pulled at my heartstrings a lot. Second episode was more you know zombie esque, but. It was fun. I had a good time with it. Uh, I'm just going to say, I'm really glad that we're doing this as well, because hearing you guys, your opinions and your breakdowns of these shows for your first time watching it is incredible to me because I wish I could go back and see this first season for the first time. Like I, it's awesome. Well, I, 
Yeah, man. Great, great choice. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm excited for True Detective too. Like I've heard that's really good. So I'm excited for the next series as well. And I just spoiled Brian. So if you want to cut that, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, Since we're on it, we're doing you season one as well. Can't fucking wait. Let's go. That, oh, I don't know. You've changed that 45 times. Who the fuck knows what we're doing, man? And, and stay hey. tuned for, and stay tuned for Dexter. Hey, Brian. <laughs> and it's Stranger Matt. Things. And then, yeah, I said Stranger Things. Yeah, man. Let's go. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of town that week. That month. No, you're not. We'll no, wait. You're not. All right, uh, let's shout out our blood donors. Really appreciate y'all. Our final girl donor, Christina Tower. I'm excited to review that movie, The Mist, later down the road. Camper level reoccurring, Clayton J., Nina, Michelle Merza, the Horror Movie Crew podcast, Alex Ellingson, and Michael Evans. Camp counselor reoccurring, Edwin Hernandez Gunn, Joe Swinford, Shan, Adrian Aiello, Brian Samick, Andrew Ferguson, Matt Strickland, Brooke Maley, Thorne David Phillips, Heather Superdoc, and Jennifer Davis from the Too Close to Home podcast. We really appreciate y'all's support. It means a lot to us. Uh, y'all take a big burden off of us. Thank you very much. Uh, Dustin, you got any final thoughts on your first episodes of your series you picked? No, like I said, I'm I'm glad that we're doing this because I enjoy it so much, and I'm glad that you all enjoy it too. If you didn't, I would have to question your uh, taste. I, I'm for real about to go watch three and four right now because like Hell after yeah. we're done with this recording, it's officially the next week to me and I'm, I'm ready. It's, it's <laughs> funny because it's funny because like a, you guys know the listeners don't, but I did the scene by scene. I had this done like a week ago. And so I've been sitting on it and I was already asking like, who's doing episodes three and four. Like I, I didn't want to stop after watching it. So uh, yeah, yeah it, it definitely draws you in. Absolutely. And I've seen and uh, I've seen the show. That's what's crazy. It's like I've seen it. Yeah. And I still I'm just like I wanna I, what I wanna see what happens next. <laughs> Man, I was the same way with Hill House. Like I know we're done with that, but as I was doing like my two episodes, like I would just watch the next one anyways, just because I like it so much. So I know what you mean. Uh, we really yeah. appreciate all the fan support. It means a lot to us. I hope you've been enjoying these de- the the spin off show DGOT the series. It's been fun. We really appreciate y'all support. Y'all have a good one. Just wanna remind everybody. Uh,